Hi, my name's Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 2445 today. We're going to start right up front here with the coupling procedure. Uh, right here you have your coupler lock as this uh, sits here. This would be in the unlocked position. Uh, it does have a hold back in that unlocked position. So this is going to be your loading position. From here we're going to go ahead and raise that tongue jack three inches above your ball. We're going to go ahead and center your uh, ball and drop underneath that coupler. We would then go ahead and lower that coupler down on top of that ball. Once it is fully seated, we're going to go ahead and slide this coupler forward. Uh, what we're looking for and what we want to pay special attention is that these two vampire teeth on the rear of that uh, mechanism are fully engaged there into the frame. Uh, from there, uh, once you are locked onto that ball, you can go ahead here and, and utilize this secondary pin uh, to go ahead and lock that coupler down, keep that from potentially rattling loose going down the road. Uh, from there, feel free to go ahead and uh, run your jacks all the way up there. Um, run your jack all the way up there. And then we are going to go ahead and cross your chains. So we're going to cross your tow chains uh, hook underneath the coupler here. Hook those on to the tow chain hooks of the vehicle. Uh, riding right next to those, we want your emergency breakaway cable. Uh, now it is wrapped up here in this zip tie, but that would be cut loose. Uh, and that's going to run right beside those tow chains uh, with a third connection point on the receiver. So it's very important that we want a third connection point. Uh, now it is state law in Texas that these tow chains, uh, first, of all, first of all, they do need to be crossed. Uh, second of all, they cannot make contact with the pavement at any given time. So uh, you'll wanna kind of skate the line of having more than enough room to make your turns, uh, but not so much room that they are making contact. Seven-way plug is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle in your vehicle. Uh, Seven-pin receptacle is going to give you a full function to your vehicle's charging system, braking system, uh, lights, things like that. When this is plugged into your vehicle, think of it at that point in time as one large vehicle as opposed to two separate vehicles. So uh, very, very straightforward there. Uh, coming up here, we have your Lippert Smart Jack. Uh, this is uh, electric tongue jack. Uh, it does operate very standard as such. You have up or down operation corresponding with the arrows. Uh, light there on the underside, which is going to light this coupler if you're doing any of that work under, uh, after dark, uh, as well as giving you a point of reference to back up uh, in the event uh, that, again, you are going to do any loading and unloading after dark. Uh, what makes it a smart jack is it does have uh, hitch height memory, and it also is going to have an auto retract feature here. Uh, using both of those features is going to be outlined on this sticker here on the side and it is a series of keystrokes that are going to accommodate that or accomplish that I should say. Uh, you do also have a manual drive here uh, that is going to be a three quarter inch drive nut. That three quarter inch size is going to be a common thread throughout the camper. Uh, stabilizer, manual stabilizer jacks are going to be three quarter inch drive. Lug nuts are going to be three quarter inch drive. Gravity feed for your spare tire is going to be three quarter inch drive. So it's nice to have that common thread throughout the camper. Uh, behind that, we have two, or excuse me, three 20 pound propane tanks. They are full for you today. Uh, these are the standard uh, propane tanks, safe variants you're going to find on any gas grill. Uh, service valve is on the top, uh, easily marked open and close. Uh, you run two propane tanks uh, hooked up to the unit at any given time and then one here uh, in the auxiliary position. Now those tanks are going to be separated by an automatic switchover regulator here. Uh, what that means is if you have both of these service valves open, it's going to draw off of your primary tank, which would be any, the one that this is pointed to. Uh, once it's uh, used the entirety of that tank, it's going to automatically switch over here to the secondary tank. Uh, if you want to avoid that from happening, uh, just go ahead and turn this secondary tank valve off. Uh, from there, you would have to manually switch it over here and then go ahead and open it uh, when you uh, want to use it. Uh, that is all covered by this propane cover here. Uh, sits on these tracks uh, and does get latched down. Uh, it does have an access door on the top for uh, you know, turning those valves on and off without having to remove that full cover. Coming around here to the side, uh, we have half of your battery bank. Uh, your battery bank in this unit is made up of two Group 24 deep cycle batteries. Uh, good thing to talk about is going to be battery maintenance. Uh, 
Uh, every 90 days, it's very important that we go ahead and pull these vent panels. Uh, there is a clear marked water line in those, uh, underneath those panels. Uh, and we do just wanna make sure we are maintaining that water level uh, with those, uh, specifically with distilled water. So it is very important that we do uh, use distilled water. And again, that's gonna be half of your battery bank. You have a similar door here on the other side that's going to hold another separate deep cycle battery. Uh, this generator compartment here is going to not only has the, the potential to house a generator, it's going to also carry your lug wrench, which again is going to be a three quarter inch lug wrench. It also does have your battery disconnect switch here at the rear of the compartment. Uh, easiest way to orientate yourself with that is if you can physically remove the key, you would be disconnected or those batteries would be isolated from the system. If that key is locked in, and it looks like that lug wrench is in the way a little bit, if that key is locked in and you are connected and everything is in uh, working order there. Uh, down low here, reference it, but you again have a three quarter inch drive nut uh, for the stabilizer jacks. Uh, that is again going to be a, a common thread. You could uh, very well use the lug wrench, although it's not designed for that. You will have a secondary crank handle that we're just going to slip over that drive nut. Uh, name of the game with those is uh, we want to kind of use a light touch with them. They are not for leveling. They are solely for stabilization. Uh, keep it from feeling like you're walking around uh, on a, you know, the suspension of the camper. So come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Uh, same thing on the way up. We don't have to go ahead and, um, you know, really bear down on them. Uh, they'll stay in great shape later. Uh, longer if you kind of use a light touch. Uh, we have your toy lock here. Uh, this is a great feature. This is going to secure any outdoor equipment that you may carry, be carrying with you. Uh, it is just a ratcheting cable lock. Uh, of course, it has uh, its own set of keys. It, it's an excellent feature, again, especially if you are carrying outdoor equipment for you. Of course, the generator, uh, as far as I know, would not be designed to run in this compartment so the idea being is you would remove that generator lock it in place here so nobody walks away with it and go ahead and run it here on the exterior of the unit uh, we have a small uh, excuse me a small storage compartment here uh, it's not very deep or anything I generally will recommend my customers to maybe keep some septic components in there like septic elbows uh, spare set of gloves things like that uh, as far as I know, that would be the best uh, thing, things that it could accommodate. Uh, a little further down, we have your freshwater blade valve there. Uh, that corresponds with a two and a half inch PVC elbow on the back side of the tank. Uh, it is just a six inch pull uh, forward uh, to go ahead and dump that. Uh, it takes about a minute or two to dump all 30, 40 gallons of fresh water from the unit. Uh, while we're down here, we're going to talk about tire pressure and lug nuts. Now these tires, they carry a max tire pressure rating of 65 PSI. Uh, with all trailer tires, uh, we want to run those at the max tire pressure rating. Uh, now that is stamped on the sidewall of the tire. Also, it is uh, stamped on the data tag uh, front of the uh, generator compartment. So right here, we're going to see uh, 65 PSI. Or excuse me, these are these must be load range E. Uh, they've changed that, and these are going to carry an 80 psi tire pressure. So, uh, switching stuff up on me. Uh, Cody was focused there on the uh, lug nut warning, uh, which is very important. So, what that warning sticker is going to say is that those lug nuts need to be retorqued. Uh, they've been retorqued to 100 foot pounds here in the shop. It is very important that we maintain that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, that intervals are gonna be the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. We're gonna stop and we're gonna go ahead and retorque those down to 100 foot pounds. Uh, so if you don't currently own a torque wrench, it's a great time to buy. Uh, you will use it because the manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, we're gonna go, wanna go ahead and still further make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, Large slide out with this unit. It's a good time to talk about general slide out maintenance. Uh, this utilizes the Swintec system, uh, which uses two independently geared motors to bring that slide in and out. Uh, we'll talk about proper operation when we get to the inside, but from a maintenance standpoint, 
Uh, it's very important that once every 90 days, we're going to not only lubricate these tracks, top to bottom, left to right, but we wanna go ahead and condition the seals as well. Uh, when we talk about lubricating these tracks, uh, what that's going to mean is we're gonna use a dry silicone lubricant, and we're gonna go ahead and spray those tracks down. We're gonna run that slide in and out a couple times, uh, and we'll be good for the next 90 days. Uh, now here we're gonna use an RV grade seal conditioner on these seals. These seals wrap around the full opening of the slide. Uh, generally, of course, follow the directions on the can, but what that generally looks like is we go ahead and spray those down. You let it sit for a certain amount of time, wipe off any excess, and then go ahead and bring the slide in and do the seals on the inside. So you have a seal, this, this slide seals in the in and out position, so it is important to go ahead and treat both sets of seals. Uh, coming around here, large, large storage compartment that you have here. Uh, as far as I know, it doesn't really carry a weight rating. I just generally will recommend my customers to use common sense more than anything with what they choose to store in here. Um, back of your fridge panel here, uh, from a maintenance standpoint, there's not too terribly much you're gonna have to contend with here. Uh, all of your operation is going to be on the front side of the unit. Again, just too terribly, not too terribly much you're gonna do. Uh, but my number one recommendation is going to be protecting it from mud daubers, flying insects. Uh, those insects are attracted to the smell of propane. So what they would generally will happen is they will crawl within the compartment, uh, build their nest as deep within the appliance as they can get, generally leaving it inoperable. And, and just FYI, that's not only with the refrigerator, that is with all of the propane appliances within the unit. Uh, so a little bit of foresight, uh, protecting these appliances can really save you some money in the long run. Uh, now, other than that, uh, it's going to be also be my recommendation to go ahead and remove the vent cover here, uh, get a flashlight, stick your head in there, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure those wires are still in decent shape, you're not seeing any fraying or anything like that, uh, just anything that may look suspect, do that a couple times a year. Uh, keep the mud dollars flying insects out and that appliance is going to last you a long time. Now this vent cover will be in place. This is what you're going to see when using the unit. Uh, these are easily removable. They go ahead, these tabs, these tabs go ahead and insert from the top. Once they are seated properly, you have two holes here. We line those up. Uh, once that is seated flush, you go ahead and give these a quarter turn. That's going to go ahead and lock them on. I go back and just give it a little tug, make sure it is in fact locked on. Uh, a lot of people lose these, so this is a common replaceable part uh, because they're not installed properly, so keep that in mind. Uh, something that they do here on the 2445 is they separate your dump valves here. Uh, so what you have is two gray water holding tanks. Generally, that means one is going to be for the bathroom and one for the kitchen, and it all depends on the floor plan. And that's what you have here. So you have a gray water here and you have a gray water here. Uh, gray water is going to be anything, again, that comes from the sink or the shower, the relatively clean water of the two. Uh, and then you have black water here, uh, which is going to be body waste, toilet waste, anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, very important that we keep these valves in the closed position. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and we're only going to dump as necessary. Especially with this black water tank, we want to keep that solid body waste within it in its wet or flowing condition. And the only way to accommodate that is by keeping it in the closed position. And now to dump either one of these three valves, it is just going to be a six inch pull towards you. That is going to evacuate the corresponding tank. Uh, bayonet style fitting here. Now your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way that cap comes off. You'll have four prongs along the outside. You'll line the keyholes up in the halfway position. Give it a quarter turn. That's going to go ahead and lock everything on. Uh, again, very important that we do keep that black water tank spe specifically in as wet or flowing condition as we can. We have your outside shower here. Uh, you know, nothing too crazy with this. You do have access to hot and cold water here. Uh, you have a momentary or a, 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 a hard on off switch there. Uh, what I have seen though is since people don't constantly see water flowing here, they can forget they have it on on the valves. Uh, this really opens up to the cabinetry within the unit and I have seen or heard of people ultimately closing the door uh, and then dumping water into the unit there. So just something to be aware of uh, as you use the unit. 
So we have your city water connection here. Uh, pressure is very important when we do talk about the city water connection here. These units are designed to have a working water pressure, uh, 40 to 75 PSI. It is very important that we do not, do not exceed that 75 PSI. Now we do include a water pressure regulator with you. Uh, this water pressure is going to regulate that pressure in between 40 and 50 PSI. This is gonna hook directly onto the water source and then we're going to hook your, your drinking water hose onto that. And then of course, ultimately we're going to hook your drinking water hose onto the uh, camper by rotating that trailer bound connection like so. Uh, again, if that 40 to 50 PSI is not enough water pressure for you, feel free to upgrade to either an adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow water pressure regulator. As long as again, we're not exceeding that 75 PSI, we're gonna be in good shape there. Now, riding right beside that, you want to pay special attention uh, that you are noting the colors here. Uh, you have your black tank flush. Now, that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Now, it is an excellent feature. It, it works really well. It's going to keep that, uh, any compounding issues within the tank from happening. It's going to keep those sensors nice and clean. I recommend that you use it every single time you take the unit out or bringing the unit back before storing it. Now it is very important that we use a, a small amount of caution with it. Uh, there is no check valve within that tank to keep that wastewater within the tank if you were to overflow it. What that means for you is that uh, if, if you were to let water run in here indefinitely, uh, what that's going to mean is the path of least resistance, believe it or not, is the rooftop septic vents. So what I recommend generally with my customers is no longer than five minutes with water rushing in here before ultimately relieving it here at the valve that's gonna give you the best rinsing action. Or if you have somebody with you, they can watch the monitor panel on the inside, watch it fill up, and then holler at you when it is time to drain it here. Excellent, excellent feature, uh, but make sure you do use some caution uh, with that. Uh, 30 amp, 110 volt service for this unit. Uh, what that means for you is if we go ahead and look here at the plug, we have one L-shaped prong. Uh, as long as we line that up with the corresponding prong, you shouldn't have any problems. Once we're fully inserted, we're going to give it an eighth inch turn to the right. That locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. Uh, a couple recommendations I do make for the unit. Number one is going to be for every unit that I do deliver, I recommend the use of a 30 amp surge protector. A lot, of, a lot of stuff going on in this unit electronically, and it is the number one thing you can do to protect your investment. If you have any questions on the further importance of a surge protector or which product to buy, uh, feel free to com consult our parts department. They'd be more than happy to educate you on which products to start looking at. Uh, also, we're gonna include a 30 to 15 amp style reducer for the unit. Uh, that is beneficial if you wanna go ahead and pre-cool the refrigerator, maybe check the function of some lights or things like that, um, you know, before taking the unit out, uh, which a lot of people like to do. Now, again, it's a, it's a small puck style reducer uh, and it, uh, it works well for those kind of low draw applications. Now, if you want to do something more than that, possibly run the air conditioner for a short period of time, um, or you know, even maybe do some 15 amp service camping, it's going to be my recommendation that you upgrade that puck style reducer uh, to a dog bone style reducer, which is generally just separated by 12 inches worth of cord. It actually helps dissipate that heat a whole lot better. It's going to be better for uh, the unit overall and ultimately for your power cord if you go ahead and use one of those in the event that you do want to uh, you know, run some higher draw appliances. Uh, so beside that power cord, we have your cable satellite inlet that's uh, designed to accommodate either a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package. A lot of KOAs or higher end campgrounds will offer a park cable service. Just about every satellite provider is offering a package specifically geared towards RVers. Either way, this is gonna be the inlet of those services. They will transition or terminate at the designated TV areas of the camper. Moving on here to the rear, not too terribly much going on here on the rear of this unit. We of course have your tube storage bumper here uh, designed to accommodate a sewage hose. Uh, although the, a lot of the higher end, the nicer, uh, ro more robust sewage hoses are not going to fit in this uh, tube storage. Feel free to use it for any other long storage that you may need. Uh, rooftop ladder access here, 
Uh, it's a good point to talk about further maintenance within the unit. Um, now, again, on that same 90-day maintenance schedule, we're not only going to maintain the batteries, we're going to uh, maintenance the slide out, but we're also going to do a 360-degree inspection of all of the seals on the unit. Uh, anywhere where two pieces come together on the body, they're gonna go ahead and utilize some sort of sealant. Generally, it's going to be a combination of butyl and silicone on the body. On the roof, we're going to either be uh, looking at a butyl-backed roof tape or a self-leveling lap sealant. Uh, generally best suited to source those uh, products from an RV dealer or parts house. Uh, and what we're looking for, again, on that 90-day maintenance schedule is any degradation in those seals. Any separation, any cracking, any peeling, anything like that we want to uh, address immediately. Uh, we're going to want to stop any water intrusion uh, issues as, as quickly as we can. Um, and that's it. So, yeah, very important that we do that. Uh, again, every 90 days we're going to go ahead and inspect them. Uh, make sure everything looks as it as it should. Uh, door here for the rear, um, which is cool to access. Uh, this is going to drop you right into your uh, bunk beds, uh, which is cool uh, when it is a bed, but also if you're not planning on utilizing the bunk bed, you can go ahead and lift this board up. If these, you gotta of course fold this mattress over first. And then you have a bar latch right here with inside the door that's going to keep that up out of the way. You can store any tall, any tall storage in that compartment. It makes it a very usable space uh, that is not, um, you know, taken up full time by the bunk bed. So it's a really cool feature. Another secondary large storage compartment here. Uh, I'm not going to access it. Of course, we're very close to the camper on this side. All these storage compartments I didn't mention before, they do have this magnetic hold open, which is a great feature. Uh, it's going to last a lot longer than those kind of old school clip style, uh, but they work exceptionally well. Uh, and again, use common sense with what you store here into these storage compartments. They are oversized. Uh, you don't want to overload them. Uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, dropping down low, we do have a propane line, a secondary propane line. Uh, this is designed for any high flow propane appliance. So whether that's a gas grill, propane fire pit, propane heater, they will all be accommodated as long as it's a high flow propane appliance. Uh, this utilizes a quick disconnect coupler. What that means is you have a locking collar up here. You can go ahead and slide that locking collar back, insert the male end fully. Uh, once you're inserted fully, it's gonna go ahead and snap back, locking it on. And we have a secondary valve back here uh, to go ahead and turn that flow on. As an added safety feature, you cannot connect or disconnect with that propane line on. And just like any other valve, if you're with the flow, you're on uh, against the flow is going to be off. When going down the road, make sure this dust cap is in place. It's going to keep any road debris uh, from gumming up the works there. Uh, here on the, uh, you know, kind of front of the unit or side of the unit, we have your standard RV style hand assist rail here. Uh, some people like to fold it against the door when traveling. Uh, some like again, it's the body, uh, and then of course it locks in the out position for use. So the very standard uh, thing there. Steps are going to be up and in. Again, very kind of standard stuff or the usual suspects as I call them. Uh, also, you have a door hold open, uh, things like that. Things, some things you're just going to find on every camper, and this is kind of those things. Uh, we have your six gallon Atwood Dometic dual source water heater here. Now this runs on propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition uh, or it runs on standalone 110 volt electricity. Uh, runs most efficient, it also runs on both as well. So your recharge rates when looking at both, uh, if you're running both sources, you're gonna be somewhere at like 17 gallons per hour. Uh, standalone propane is gonna be 15 gallons an hour. And then lastly, electricity is going to be 11 gallons per hour. Uh, maintenance is very important for the unit. Uh, anytime we're going to be storing the unit for more than seven days, we do want to go ahead and drain it. Uh, and it's very important from a safety standpoint that we follow the right uh, steps to do so. So number one, give it ample time to cool down, at least three or four hours. Uh, it is very well insulated. It can take a fair amount of time to drop in temperature. 
Once you're fairly certain of the temperature, it's very important that we do go ahead and depressurize it. A couple of options to utilize there. Um, the easiest being uh, just using the internal fixture on the inside. The hot side of that fixture, if we go ahead and we turn that on, as long as we have cut the inflow of water to the unit, so if there, we're running off the potable water and the water pump, we just need to turn that switch off. If we're running off a city water connection, we just need to go ahead and uh, either turn that fixture off or cut that supply of water. Uh, once we have done that, uh, we can go ahead and then again, kind of backtracking, turn that hot side of the spigot on. That's going to allow that excess pressure to build off, to, to, to uh, be relieved. And uh, you may see some water come out of it with it as well. Once there's no more water coming out of the fixture, we're safe to come here and go ahead and, and drain it. What you have here is a 15 16th nylon plug. Uh, it goes, it, it's a good time to bring up that we do want to keep that a nylon plug. Uh, not going to want to replace it with a brass plug or anything like that because it is a secondary safety feature. If the pressure within the unit grows to an unsafe level, it's going to overcome those threads and spit that out. Uh, also, if you do replace that with uh, any other plug than this nylon plug, it's going to go ahead and void your warranty with that with Dometic. So a couple, couple good reasons to keep this uh, standard equipment here. So once we go ahead and back that out, the remaining of your water is going to drain from this location here. Uh, and, and you know, you're going to see about four, four to five gallons of water come here. Uh, once we've, we've done that, you can either leave the cap sitting here, you can go ahead and, you know, put it in a couple threads or put it all the way in, whatever. Uh, that's how we're going to store the unit. Now, when we go to return the unit to service, it is very important that we go ahead and pr uh, prime the water heater or feed six gallons of water into the water heater before lighting it. Uh, that process is going to look very similar to depressurizing it, uh, but essentially the exact opposite. So we're going to introduce a flow of water into the unit. Again, if we're utilizing the potable water here, we're going to turn on that 12 volt uh, water switch. If we are using city water, we're going to physically hook up that hose and, and turn that spigot on. Once that water is flowing into the unit, uh, we're then going to use that hot side of any spigot on the inside. Go ahead and turn that on. Now that flow is going to initially be very bubbly, very spitty, uh, airy. What it's doing is it's working the air that has filled the tank uh, and replacing it with water. So once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is our indicator that we can go ahead and uh, start using the appliance here. Uh, other than that, of course, give it an inspection when you're draining it or filling it, make sure everything is good, but also very important, this is a propane burning appliance, so we do need to screen this off, keep the mud daubers and flying insects from nesting there on the inside of that. Uh, when closing the door, you just line up the latch here, uh, go ahead and give it a pull, turn it, and it's going to go ahead and lock on. Um, beside this, we have kind of an uh, external TV area. Uh, what that means is uh, in the inside, we're going to find a secondary uh, TV mount that's going to mount here. You have multiple power sources, uh, 12 volt cigarette style receptacle, a couple USBs, and then a couple 110 volt all weather outlets, again, depending on this TV uh, that you want to use. Potable water here. Now, this is going to be the onboard. This is going to be the onboard holding tank for water. We're going to stick a garden hose directly in here, fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once we are full, we cap it off. Uh, and then again, we need to use that onboard water pump to pressurize that system and draw it up to the fixtures and make it usable. We then have your 12 volt suburban furnace here, uh, or excuse me, your propane suburban furnace here. Excuse me, Dometic furnace here. Uh, this is going to be a propane driven appliance with a 12 volt blower motor. So we can use this off grid, uh, from a maintenance standpoint, not too terribly much you're going to do here. Uh, it is very important that we keep this, uh, free flowing. We don't want to block that exhaust at all. Uh, and again, goes without saying, we do need to put a, a screen over that to keep those mud daubers and flying insects from nesting, uh, within the appliance. Uh, throughout the camper, you're going to see these mounts. Now, this is meant to accommodate a Furon Bluetooth speaker. It's a really cool feature that Lance has started doing. Uh, it's just a small Bluetooth rechargeable speaker. 
uh, and it, it, you know, you can move it from location to location and ultimately to the charging dock on the inside. Uh, in this same area, we have your hood vent, uh, and it's very important that we go ahead and open that up before cooking a meal there on the cooktop. It does just have some tabs, and then again, we need to close it before going down the road. Uh, we want to keep any weather from getting in there, especially when we're going down the road. Uh, moving on, we have a, another propane port here. Uh, that is, again, going to just be that quick connect uh, fitting. Uh, like we saw at the rear of the camper. We also have the gravity feed for your spare tire here. Uh, again, that's gonna be a three quarter inch drive nut. We're gonna go ahead and follow the instructions uh, as terms of direction there. Uh, once it reaches the ground, we can go ahead and, and muscle that on out uh, and change any tire as necessary. When it comes to changing a tire, uh, we are going to wanna put our jack uh, directly on the axle as close to the tire as you can get without it interfering in your work. Go ahead and change your tire, uh, and of course follow you know the safety precautions that you would when you're changing any tire. Uh, storage compartment here um, held in there again with a bar latch. This drawer, this slide out drawer, is fully removable. We would have to remove that pin there. Uh, say you go to the beach, you get some sand in there. You can go ahead and pull it out, rinse it out, uh, keep it nice and clean. Make sure when you have it loaded up with gear, you're utilizing that bar latch. Uh, that way excuse me, that way that uh, your gear is not slamming across the, the door here. Uh, tabletop here, I love that Lance includes this. Uh, the, the hideaway location is great. It is just a standard, um, you know, nothing special card table, but the inclusion of it uh, is a pretty cool feature. Uh, the other side of your battery bank here, that's gonna carry the same maintenance as the other side, and we've already talked about that. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is going to be your solar plug here. Uh, now this is designed for a portable solar panel. Uh, the biggest selling point to those portable solar panels is you can uh, park your unit in a nice shady area and go ahead and, and carry your portable panel out into the sun and take in any, any solar uh, as necessary. Now generally these are plug and play connections. These are going to be a direct connection to the battery. Most of those portable panels have the charge controller built directly into the panel. That's going to be the brains of the operation. That's going to take in energy as necessary. It's kind of a, a set and forget kind of setup, uh, but it is it's a very cool feature that it is included uh, here with the unit. Now that just about covers it here on the outside of the unit. We're going to go ahead and hop on the inside and take a look at that stuff there. So we're going to start off here on the inside uh, talking about these, these, this uh, lot going on here right inside the entry door. Uh, we have your main exterior light cluster here, which is going to be your patio light, honesty, awning light, things like that. Uh, your patio light in particular is going to be on a three-way switch. Middle position is going to be off. Uh, one position is going to be a bright white LED. The other position is going to be like an amber colored bug light. Uh, awning lights here. Uh, we can, of course, control those awning lights uh, with this switch, or we can, of course, use the in-command center, which we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. Excuse me, courtesy light here is just a light we can hit coming into the door uh, to light our way, allow us to see enough to access some other switches to get some more lights on. Slide out mood light here is just going to be the backlighting there on the slide out. Uh, nice cool little feature there, uh, the accent lighting. Uh, awning switch here, now you have your retract and extend buttons here. Uh, they don't really do anything in this this. Capacity. Now it is tied to the in-command center, but this on and off switch is kind of like a dead man switch. This needs to be on to ultimately run it out here in the command center. Uh, and also with this switch on, that's going to uh, give you function to the wind protection features and things like that. Uh, now jumping up here to the in-command center, uh, when you take delivery of the unit, your code should be 1234. Uh, now looking here in the command center, we have uh, some choices down here. Now we have interior lights. That's going to, of course, be that courtesy light. Uh, we have your water heater options here. So we can choose gas, um, gas and electric, or, you know, you have all, all your choices there. Uh, and then we can go back and we have the water pump on and it's going to give us battery voltage there. Uh, now up here, we have some uh, other settings, like we're going to go ahead in here into the HVAC uh, setting. That's going to be um, air conditioner as well as your furnace. 
And your main mode button is going to be here, and you can cycle through those modes. You have a multitude of different options um, when it comes to that. Uh, you can set schedules, things like that. It is a very um, customizable thermostat in terms of time and temperatures, things like that. Uh, back here into the main display, we have more light options here. Uh, we again have that entry light. We have the awning lights as well. Uh, back there into the main setting, we can bring the awning in and out in this display here. Again, turning that awning light on and off. We can we run our slide and our stabilizer jacks down here as well. So of course, well we talked about the manual, uh, the manual override there on the outside, but these are powered uh, here on the in command center. Uh, again, same rule applies when you're using the motor. You're going to come down, make contact with the pavement, and stop immediately. Uh, slide out is going to be the last, uh, the last um, mode on that display. Uh, and again, when we talk about the Schwintex system, we have a very large slide out here. It's very important that we bring that slide all the way in or extend it fully. So no halfway points, no short bursts. Uh, the, the, because the, we have those two independently geared motors, uh, what can happen is if we do those things, it can actually bind the slide in its opening and then it's not going to easily move in either direction. So all the way in, all the way out, uh, no, no short burst. It does have an electric brake on the motor, so bring, hold, that, hold it in that direction until the slide physically stops. Don't try and time it or anything like that. Uh, back there into the, the main panel, we uh, of course have a settings button here. I encourage you to really go in depth in reading the manual of this before we go ahead into the settings and start changing things around. If you have any questions uh, about this in command center, please give us a call really before you start getting in here and pushing buttons because you can really kind of do some damage if you're, if you're not 100% sure on, on what you're doing. Uh, and then we have also your tank monitors on this in command panel as well. Those are going to be there on the top display uh, and they use kind of like a bar uh, graph style thing to tell you how full they are. Of course, you can see the fresh water is two thirds full. The rest of the tanks there would be empty. So the in command center, it gives you all of your information, it gives you control of everything in one single location. It's very good for that. Uh, it works very well for that. But again, uh, educate yourself further before you really get in here and, and start uh, kind of making adjustments and things like that. Uh, turn it around uh, here into the bunk area, the top bunk bed here. Uh, of course, we have a charging station there. It's 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle, a couple USBs. Beside that, a couple 110 volt outlets. Uh, and then a little further, we have a docking station for the Furon uh, speaker as well. Uh, that is just a dock station. It's going to mount there. You can use it from that location, of course, uh, but it is ultimately to charge it there. Um, bunk bed is in the folded up position. We did that uh, on the other side. And... Uh, you know, you have your light back there, uh, not really too terribly much to speak of. Uh, access into that compartment. Well, you would think. This is, um, I have no idea. This, this is going to be the in-command center, um, the hub of that. Uh, so I guess that's where everything is transitioning from. Uh, this in-command center is a newer product for us, so we're still learning uh, about it as much as you are. Uh, into the bathroom here, um, nothing too crazy or earth shattering uh, to talk about. Of course, you have a uh, exhaust fan here, standard RV style exhaust fan. You have a toggle switch there. This is going to draw out uh, any moisture in the air when you are, uh, of course, taking a shower, uh, anything like that. Uh, shower head is going to have that standard RV style on off switch there on the head that's going to help you conserve. Uh, hot water, uh, your water supply in general. Uh, you'll probably find yourself doing like military, navy style showers, things like that. Uh, nice large shower though with the bowed shower curtain up here. It does give you a lot of kind of uh, wing room uh, for even a, a larger person. Uh, porcelain bowl here, uh, pedal style. Uh, it's going to be a light press to feed water into the bowl, full press to flush here. Uh, now, it is very important that we use a single-ply RV-grade toilet paper as well as the proper chemical treatments, uh, deodorizers, tissue dissolvers, things like that. 
Uh, again, uh, feel free to consult our parts department if you do need any education and the proper products to use. We're not going to cover that here in this presentation, but just give us a call. We'd be happy to, to again, educate you. Uh, you know, turning around, not too terribly much. I mean, you got a, a medicine cabinet. Uh, the, the sink here is really cool. Um, Design-wise, it, it looks really nice. Uh, we have your ceiling light switch here, vanity light switch here on the left. But again, just really kind of basic stuff in here. Not nothing, you know, really earth shattering or, or anything crazy. Uh, coming out, we have your uh, refrigerator here. Uh, open and closed latches are going to be on the side. Uh, in the name of making this look more like a residential refrigerator, they go ahead and they've put the eyebrow panel uh, there on the inside. Um, very easy in terms of function. You have your on off switch here. Once it kind of boots up, it's going to default to the last selected mode. Uh, in our case, that was auto. Now in that auto side, it's going to look for 110 volts uh, first. If it does not find that 110 volt, it's gonna automatically switch over and start lighting on gas. Only other mode is if we wanna run it on standalone gas. So uh, those are your only two options. You have a temperature control here, uh, kind of a, you have three options, kind of a low, medium, and high. Uh, of course, further to the right, it's gonna be coldest. Uh, slide out dinette here. Uh, we have a dimmer switch here for these dinette lights, uh, as well as a hard on off switch here. Now all of the windows are going to be the exact same within the unit. We have a combination of both of those windows here uh, within the dinette. First one's gonna be your emergency exit. Uh, if you're particularly motivated enough, you'll go ahead and yank this screen out of its way. This window is gonna go full out like a doggy door. So if you're particularly motivated enough, your entry door is blocked. You can go ahead and exit this window here. Uh, and then your more traditional style window is gonna be the crank style here. And these will have a fold out pivot point. We go ahead and fold that out. That will allow us to go ahead and crank this window open or closed. And they are all going to also have these projector style shades. It's going to be a light pool to bring that down. That's gonna be, you know, that's gonna give you some privacy, but let some light in as well. Or we have kind of a full uh, white out shade that's your, or your privacy shade there. And just like any other kind of projector style, it's going to be a, a light tug and they'll go ahead and, and retract up. Now this dinette also uh, does make a bed. Uh, this, this dinette does make a bed. Um, what, how you're going to do that is you would remove the tabletop. Uh, from the pedestal base here, then we would go ahead and work that pole from the flange on the floor. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get rid of the pole. A, lot, a good option is just laying it down there on the ground. Uh, from there, we're going to take that tabletop. We're going to go ahead and place it right here on these ledges. Uh, we're then going to remove that rear cushion or that small cushion, and we're going to replace it with these two longer cushions. It's going to make that into a very nice uh, sleeping area and will work well. Uh, underneath the dinette, we have a storage here. It's important how we operate these latches. Um, if I'm being honest, they're not the most robust latches. And what I've seen is people kind of try and unlock and pull it open at the same time. Uh, make sure you're giving it, you know, make sure you're, you're, you're physically unlocking it before pulling it uh, and it's going to stay in better shape for you. Uh, of course, lock it before going down the road. That's going to keep your gear from uh, ultimately coming out here. Uh, jumping back over here to the kitchen area, um, you know, nothing too crazy as well. Um, we have your fixture here. You have different spray modes there on the actual fixture. You can pull it down. Uh, things like that uh, work really well. Uh, nice large open sink uh, with your countertop extenders here, which are going to uh, be nice when you are pre prepping a meal, things like that. We have a removable trash can there. Uh, again, it's, it's nice to have all that stuff kind of built into the, uh, the countertop there. Uh, we have your cooktop here. Uh, we'll go ahead and turn that on. And then you have a, a, a igniter here. And I'm not sure if we even have the gas on up front. Uh, there we go. So you go ahead and turn it to uh, the high position there. We go ahead and uh, hit that igniter that's going to go ahead and light those burners up. Now we're going to light the oven a little different um, 
in a different way. Just like you would light any other pilot light, uh, we're going to switch that on to pilot and we do need to hold that to allow that gas to flow through the line. Uh, we're then going to take a long stem barbecue lighter and if you look down here, we have two prongs. One of them is going to be the actual propane line and the other is going to be the thermal coupler. We're going to want to put our flame directly in between the two. While holding this pilot light, we're going to hold our flame there until we see that, that light up. And then we're going to hold this pilot light for a few seconds longer. That, and that's going to allow that thermal coupler to heat up. We can then go ahead and turn this to our designated temperature uh, and use it as designed. Now down here on the floor, we have your uh, safety alert. This is going to be your car carbon monoxide propane leak detector. Uh, now this is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. Uh, so there's no batteries to change or anything like that. It does have a test button and functions very much like a smoke alarm. It's going to let you know which gases it is sensing uh, by a series or different colors there of the, the uh, lights. So just if that goes off on you, just you know, go ahead and, and read the scale there. It's going to tell you what's going on. Uh, fuse panel breaker box here. Uh, everything there on the left is going to be an automotive blade style fuses. Those are replaceable. It's not a bad idea to keep a variety pack of fuses with the unit uh, in the event that you would need one. Everything on the right is going to be a resettable light switch style breaker, very much as what you're used to seeing in your fuse panel box at home. Uh, those are resettable breakers. In terms of function, everything is going to be clearly labeled there on the door. Now we have your water heater access here on the back side. And this is something that's almost definitely not going to show up on camera. Oh, well it is actually pretty accessible there. So if we look right there at that valve, uh, that's going to be your bypass for the water heater. Now when we're doing a winterization process, we're gonna go ahead and purge all the water from the system and we would replace it with an RV grade antifreeze. Uh, before doing that, it is very important that we go ahead and bypass the water heater. So we're gonna go ahead and, and flip that switch into the secondary position before coming over here to the uh, underneath of the slide out uh, where your water pump is. Uh, you could go ahead and remove these four screws. It's gonna give you better access. Once you do that, you're gonna find a clear hose in there. If we trace that clear hose back, we're going to find a valve. We're again gonna put that valve in the secondary position. We're gonna go ahead and take our clear hose and we're gonna stick it directly into a bottle of RV grade antifreeze. Before introducing it, we're gonna go ahead and again bypass that water heater and allow that. Uh, from there, we're going to turn on the water pump. We're gonna run through the fixtures, seeing pink at each, each fixture. Once we do that, we know we're fully winterized. Give it a few seconds after that to go ahead and fill up the P-traps on the way out. A um, couple switches here, sink lights, galley lights, or sink lights, soffit lights, uh, nothing too crazy. Uh, TV, we want to go ahead and, and pay attention to this ribbon here. That's going to be how we unlock it. This is, of course, in the unlocked position, uh, so pay attention to that. Uh, and then also it goes, it's good to point out that we have your antenna booster there. Now that corresponds with the uh, RG6 cable fittings we saw on the outside of the camper. Of course, this is where those uh, transition. Uh, if we're using a part cable service, uh, this red, this, this little green light needs to be in the off position. If we're using the King Jack antenna, which is going to bring in digital over the air programming, that green light needs to be on to power this antenna. Now this antenna has an on off switch on it. Now all that does is turn off this signal indicator. Uh, so after dark, you may find those lights intrusive. Uh, you can go ahead and turn that off when you're not actively looking for a signal. Um, so the more lights you see, the higher signal you have. You have an attenuator here. Uh, you can turn up your signal strength and then we can go ahead and directionalize the antenna here. Now, uh, now when we are, uh, excuse me, now it isn't always up antenna. There, there's no travel position. It will travel in any position. Uh, rotates about 350 degrees and then you have to come back the other way. Uh, down below here, we have your Jensen stereo, CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth. All of those features are gonna be utilized through this. Does HDMI arc with the television, so you have that feature. 
uh, generally find uh, most people can, can work themselves around these units pretty well. You have a single mode button that's going to take you through the modes, uh, Bluetooth pairing there, now, of course settings, presets, things like that. One thing to, to pay attention to is your zones. On this particular setup, you're going to control your zone separately. Um, and within this camper, we probably have, I don't see any speakers actually. Right below the radio. Oh, so I, so it looks like we only have this one speaker here. Uh, they may take advantage of the uh, Bluetooth speaker uh, for the rest of that. So keep that in mind. Oh, so you, you are going to have some there up, up front uh, as well. So I believe you're probably going to have at least two zones uh, and you would control each the volume of each zone separately. Uh, below that, we have your fireplace. Uh, you can use this as an electric heat option as well. If we go ahead and turn it on, um, there we have that. Uh, of course, you can dim that out, really choose the brightness of those settings. Again, we can run it heat. It runs kind of like a space heater. Uh, choose the temperature as far as that, uh, as well as your timer. Uh, up here in this location, this would be the, the transition of the, your satellite receiver. So again, we saw the inlet of those services there on the outside. This would be the outlet of those services. They give you another charging section, uh, as well as a couple 110 volt outlets as well. Uh, moving on here into the bathroom. Oh, air conditioner. Uh, air conditioner is going to be on the in command center, but it's important to talk about because it does have some uh, filters here. Now those are going to be uh, reusable filters. We'll go ahead and you have the tabs, you lift the tabs out. Uh, you can go ahead and then further remove that. Uh, you would then take that to a sink and go ahead and rinse it out uh, and then go ahead and, and reuse it. Uh, here into the bedroom, uh, you, of course, have this sliding door, which has the locking bar here, which is cool. That's just going to slide, uh, give you some privacy, especially if you're, you're camping with someone else. Uh, you do have the closet, which is, is awesome. Not something you generally will find in a camper is a closet of this size, uh, equipped with a built-in shoe rack as well. Uh, it does have its own light in there, so it is very important that you remember to turn that light off uh, with the slider. And it goes, and we didn't talk about this, but these lights that aren't switched with a wall switch, uh, they do have sliders on them. So if you, if you go, look to the front of the lens, uh, you do have a, a little slider there. Uh, here on this side of the bed, we have a light switch. It's going to be the backlighting for the, uh, each tabletop there. We have a charging section, uh, a couple 110 volt outlets as well. Uh, jumping up here, these reading lights. Uh, you have a couple options. You have a little blue accent light, uh, and then you have, of course, on off. Now, these are actually just like uh, captive touch uh, kind of buttons there. Um, storage on each side of the bed uh, with your uh, hanging rail uh, there. And we also have a large amount of storage here on the underside of the bed as well. This is going to go ahead and lift us up. Very efficient use of space there on the underside. Uh, rooftop fan here. Now in your messenger bag, and, and let me go ahead and, and get this remote out. Uh, this is a Dometic fan. Now this is going to run off a remote. Uh, these fans are excellent. They work very well uh, at controlling the temperature here. This is going to be your 12 volt option. Uh, you can run this off grid uh, to control temperature. It's going to correspond with this remote here. Um, if I can get it out of the bag here. So when you're looking at this, you have a couple options on how you control that temperature. Uh, of course, there's going to be your on off button there. And then we can just control a set speed uh, and that goes within 15% increments there. Uh, and this thing really will get up and move. Uh, or we can set a thermostat and it's going to go ahead and maintain that temperature, say throughout the night. Uh, in the event that it were to start raining throughout the night, uh, it does have a built in rain sensor on it as well. So. Uh, in the event that it were to rain, uh, you could go ahead and uh, it, would, it would automatically shut down. So it's a very uh, usable fan, works very well, again, at controlling temperature. Uh, I believe they, they rate these at like 10 mile per hour winds or something like that, but they are a really great uh, fan. With the remote, it, it doesn't get any better because you can just mount that on the side of your bed 
uh, and control it that way. It's a really cool feature there. Secondary uh, TV location, you're going to have everything you have there on the primary TV location. Uh, 110 volt outlets, 12 volt um, satellite, uh, and then of course storage here on the underside. Um, but yeah, that pretty much just about covers it here on the inside. Now there is probably a, a safe bet that I may have missed a few things here on the inside as I uh, noted, this is not a, a camper that I am personally overly familiar with. If you do have any questions, if there is something that I've missed, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we can get you the information you need and we'd be happy to do so. Uh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the walkthrough here on the 2445.